Good morning, Sanctuary Church. How are we doing this morning? So good to see you. I'd love to see a few waves from people. If you're here, hello. So good to see you. Hey, this morning I wanted to read you a verse. It's from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, but he said to me, my, gracious, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So this morning, I would love for us to be reminded of the power of who God is. That even in our weaknesses, God is stronger still. So this morning as we begin to worship, would you, um, would you take that thought and would we begin to proclaim the greatness of God's love, the, the power and the strength of who our God is. We can boast in that this morning. Let's sing together. You're calling me when faith is lost and my hope exhausted. You will be my strength when my mind says I'm not good enough. God, you're enough for me. Oh, I've decided I'm not giving up. Cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. You love me so feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. No, I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. Oh. So, oh, oh. Put your hands together. In every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Whoa. Now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete. Oh, and my mind says I'm not good enough. God, you're enough for me. Yes. Oh, I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me.
Have you come to the end of self? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, church, would you sing? Leave behind your regrets and stay. Today there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Sing it out, oh. Trade your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to. just for a second I believe that we need to declare who God is over our lives so when we sing this bridge sing oh what a savior and oh what a savior isn't he one There's power in those words this morning as we worship. Bow down before Him, we sing, for He is Lord. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. 
words we just sang would be broken over our hearts. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Christ is risen. Those words change all things for all people for all time, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, never to die again. And so, Father, we are grateful to be here. I pray that we would uh, hear your voice through your word. I pray that people would be encouraged and strengthened and inspired. Father, that they would feel the touch and sense the presence of Almighty God here at the historic Hoover Egg Ranch. We are glad to be here. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, everybody. How y'all doing? Great to see you. Wave at me. It's awesome. Hey, let's give it up for the worship band, huh? Awesome. Thank you. Hey, I want to give a big shout out to the dock there. Everybody on the dock, say hello. All of our students, we love you. You guys rock, Rocky in the dock. So great to be back again. I was on holiday last week. I'll be speaking in a couple weeks. I've been on study break, but if I'm not out of town, I just can't miss being with you. So a couple quick news items. Hey, if you're new, we love that you're here. Welcome for your first time. We have a gift for you at the yellow tent as you exit. We'd love to give you a gift. If you just want to kind of slow down, if you want to get out of your car and say hi, social distancing with a mask on, that would be awesome too. So also want to welcome our online audience. We love everybody watching online. Also wanted to mention that tonight, 7 p.m., we have our young adults, 18 to 26-ish. And so they meet right over there, my left, your right. So if you know anybody that would benefit from that, God is moving in an incredible way on Sunday nights. Also Wednesday night, 6.30, students from all over this area are coming. So that's an amazing experience too every Wednesday night, 6.30 p.m. Also wanted to mention that if you want to be a part of what's happening more than uh, what you're experiencing right now, if you'd like to volunteer, we would love that if you want more information. Lastly, I wanted to mention the greatest book in all the world that's ever been written says this. Remember this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who only plants a few seeds will get a small crop. But one who plants generously will get a generous crop. In other words, God wants you to be generous in your giving. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. See, God cares very much about our, our heart and why we give the motivation of our heart. Never to feel pressured or reluctant in our giving. And then it says, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So we want to be a generous people. Thank you again for your generosity. Your generosity is allowing us to be here and to one day be having church in that building. So if you want to give by text, 84321, you can give old school checks or you could also give online. So God bless you. So Pastor Steve Mason, who was the lead and founding pastor of Oasis Church for over 30 years, our associate pastor, my friend of three decades, and a great person who's leading the charge for the new building. Would you give it up for Pastor Steve Mason? Thanks, man. Well, good morning, everybody. So glad you're with us today. A uh, couple things real real briefly. Uh, we are making progress on the project here at the ranch. We're getting closer with the city. We're applying for some permits, and we've got uh, financing in place to close escrow. We're just waiting on the seller. So just know, I know it doesn't look like a lot of things have, have transpired or changed, but uh, we are making a lot of good progress. So what strange times we're living in right now? You know, school kids are having their lives disrupted because they can't go to school or they have to study on a computer. Some people can't go to work. Other people's jobs have been cut way back. Restaurants are closed. There's a boredom that has spread across our country because of things that are being shut down. Just, just such strange times that we live in. 
And what's kind of scary is it's starting to feel normal. We're kind of starting to get used to it. But you know, since the pandemic hit, I've heard from people about the struggles that they were having. And they're varied, they're wide. Everybody's struggles are different, but it seems like everybody struggles with something. And so that's, I kind of want to talk about that today. You know, sometimes when you give a talk like this, you don't know if it applies to everybody, but today's message does apply to all of us because we all have struggles. We all face difficulties in life. And we can see the difficulties all around us these days very clearly. Those difficulties affect all of us in different ways. Some of the difficulties are national difficulties, the pandemic that I mentioned, the political battle lines that are drawn right now like they are every four years between the Republicans and the Democrats, the protesting, the rioting, the uncertainty of the future. But you know, I don't really want to talk about those problems. I want to talk about the difficulties that we face personally, those private difficulties that we all face, whether there's a pandemic or not. And I want to see how we respond when difficulties hit our life. It could be guilt or shame over our sins or our failures. It could be broken relationships. It could be medical difficulties, financial difficulties, regret over our past or anxiety over our future. Because national difficulties affect our nation, personal difficulties affect our souls. And after a while, when you deal with difficulties for so long, the same ones over and over, you start to lose hope of ever feeling whole again. So we stop trying to end the pain, and we try to figure out how to learn to live with it. But the pain never really goes away for too, uh, too many of us. And so I want to look today at how God, driven by His own kindness, meets us at our points of pain when life throws us a curveball. The good news today is there is a pain specialist. He's called the Great Physician. Jesus knows how to help hurting people, people facing times of difficulty and uncertainty. And you know, difficulty in your life is not uncommon because it seems like on every page of the gospel, there's a story of someone who's hurting. And there's a story of Jesus meeting each person that he encountered at their point of pain. Isaiah, the prophet, prophesied about the great physician's encounters with hurting people when he said this in Isaiah 42. He said, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Isaiah tells us that when the Savior was going to come, he would be so tender and so gentle that when he finds a bruised reed or a smoldering wick, they will not suffer as a result of his presence. Can you think of anything more fragile than a bruised reed? We used to call them cottontails in the Midwest, but those bruised reeds, those ones standing tall in the marshlands, and somehow they get bent and bruised. You know, people like reeds get bruised sometimes. Bruised by betrayal, bruised by a harsh word, bruised by a personal failure, or bruised by a public humiliation. And once bent, Reeds and people sometimes just barely hold on. And Jesus says that if a bruised person meets me, I won't break him. A bruised reed will not break. And a smoldering wick, get that image in your mind. Is anything more fragile than a smoldering wick? You know, that once burning bright at the tiny piece of string at the top of a candle, and now it's just a little small flame, just barely a, a flicker that's holding on, a little flicker of light. Peep, like, and just like people who once burned brightly with hopes and dreams and passions and purpose, but when difficulties over time wear them down, they become blown by the harsh winds of life, the disappointments, discouragements, difficulties, and failures. So a once strong person turns into a smoldering wick. Not completely out, but you have to look closely to see what little hope or what little promise remains. And it seems like just one touch and they'd be done. Jesus says, when I meet people like that, when I meet a smoldering wick, they will not suffer and they will not be destroyed by me. So I want to show us some people in Scripture 
whose stories could have been and might be some of our stories. First, a woman who never dreamed she'd be in the position she found herself in one day. But in spite of her pain, she encountered a person she'd never met before, but a person she would never forget in the future. We can read her story in John chapter 8. It says, When Jesus went to the Mount of Olives at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the oldest one first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. This woman was just like so many other people that we read about, so many other people that we know of in our time. People who were absolutely helpless, hopeless. You search the New Testament for bruised reeds and smoldering wicks and you don't have to look far. You find a leper who's been cast out of society because of his sickness. You find a woman who's been in and out of the arms of five different husbands. You find a woman suffering from a blood condition so severe she spent every dime she's got trying to be made well. You find the blind, the crippled, the deaf, and the diseased. But the, weak, the, the weakest people in the Bible aren't only the people with physical infirmities. Most often, people's pain was from a broken heart. A difficulty in their life that created a pain that is unseen problems and pain that are invisible to everybody that nobody knows but that person and probably everybody here today has those kind of issues in their heart in their lives things that you've suffered disappointments you've endured failures that you've you've had in the past and nobody really knows them but you all through the bible you meet hurting people one after the other who met jesus and he was kind and he was tender to every single one of them you don't have to look hard. You don't have trouble spotting the hurting person in this story. She's the one surrounded by the religious people, and she's scared. You can imagine how embarrassed she is, maybe humiliated, bruised, and crying. And then the focus shifts to another figure, the one seated on the ground. That's Jesus. That's the Savior. That's the great physician. He's been teaching, and she's been cheating. And the Pharisees are out to kill them both. Teacher, they say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Even the accusation is enough to make you blush. She's caught in the very act. It's naked guilt. No defense. She's devastated. And she's absolutely helpless because the law was on the side of her accusers, those who would be her executioners. Now think about the position she was in. If ever there was a bruised reed or a smoldering wick, it was her. How many times in the Bible do you find people in the same condition, vulnerable and desperate, just like she was at this moment? You find them in the Old Testament, Moses at the Red Sea, rescued. Daniel in the lion's den, rescued. Jonah in the belly of a whale, he knows it's his own fault that he's there. He calls out to the one who delights to show mercy, and he's rescued. But the stories don't, aren't contained in just the Old Testament. The New Testament is full of them too. Jesus was barely down from the Sermon on the Mount when the crowd parted because a leper was there among them. The leper looks at Jesus and he says, please help me. And Matthew 8 says that Jesus reached out and touched the leper. How long had it been since anyone had touched him? How long had it been since anybody even noticed him? Or how long had it been since anybody cared? Jesus noticed. Jesus cared. 
Jesus touched him, the untouchable one, and he healed him. A woman with a blood disease reaches out in a crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment in her desperation, in her point of pain, in her need. And in the throngs of the crowd, when all of this activity is going on, he stops, turns around to the disciples and said, Who touched me? And a very timid woman steps forth and says, I did. And the crowd probably went silent. Everybody thought that she was going to be rebuked by Jesus. Instead, she left whole and healed. Peter failed Jesus on the night of his betrayal and arrest. There in that courtyard, even though it was a courtyard, the other disciples didn't even dare enter. He failed him nonetheless. And so in desperation, in failure, in heartache, he goes back to the life he had left to follow Jesus, life as a fisherman. One day as he's fishing, he sees Jesus on the shore. What Jesus says to him is remarkable. But what he doesn't say to him is even more remarkable. He doesn't say, some friend you turned out to be, Peter. I called you the rock. Man, am I disappointed in you. You let me down, Peter. You're all talk. You call yourself a Christian? You're a coward. But Jesus isn't there on the shore to inflict pain on Peter. He's there to relieve the pain that Peter already had. He says, Peter, follow me. The very same thing he had said three and a half years earlier. And in, the, in that challenge Jesus was saying to Peter the offer still stands Peter despite your failure you know some people need to hear that today you feel like it's been too long or you've done too much wrong you feel like things could never be the same that you're unusual unusable and you need to hear that God would say to you if he met you today like he did Peter that day the offer still stands Mary Magdalene was found in a cemetery early one morning. Jesus has just been crucified, and she is devastated. Her whole life died on that cross. She watched her whole life be buried in that tomb. She feels absolutely hopeless. And suddenly, there in that cemetery, Jesus suddenly appears. She was there at the cross when he suffered, and now he's there when she's suffering. She stood by him in his darkest hour, and so he was going to stand by her in her darkest hour. Think about it. Jesus, a man risen from the dead, known by everybody, claimed to be the Messiah by some, risen from the dead. He could have triumphantly paraded, paraded into Jerusalem to a crowd far greater than the first triumphal entry into that city. He could have proved all of his critics wrong. He could have verified that everything he said was true. Instead, he chose to appear to just one hurting woman who had lost all hope. Another time you find a royal officer, a man of great authority, in absolute desperation. His son is dying. This man has wealth and rank and power and privilege, and right now he would trade it all for the life of his son. So he finds Jesus, and he begs for help. He leaves Jesus, and he goes home to a miracle. And now he's got his son in his arms and the Savior in his heart. And then there was a widow from a town called Nain whose heart is devastated and broken. Twice death reached into her family, first her husband and now her son. Now as a widow... She faces an uncertain future, especially in this culture. Only now she faces it absolutely alone. There's no one there to help her anymore. No one left to hold her. There's no one in her family to comfort her in her grief. And she's taking her son to be buried. And Jesus sees her on the way to the cemetery. And he says to the woman, don't cry. And then he turns to the boy he says, young man, I say to you, get up. Two words to a grieving mother. Eight words to a dead son. But those ten words were enough. Because the boy is raised from the dead, and the mother's heart is healed. 
This miracle is an incredible display of the great physician's power. But it's a greater display of the great physician's compassion. Because she never asked for a miracle. She never fell at his feet like others did and begged for a miracle. She never demonstrated great faith or any faith for that matter. This was a miracle done without human prompting. But compassion in Jesus' heart compelled him to move into action. Scriptures only report two times of Jesus ever crying, overlooking Jerusalem and at the funeral of Lazarus. He wept for a nation that was far from God, and he wept for people who grieve. Think about that. What an incredible Savior. Weeping not just for us in our sins, but weeping with us in our suffering. The scene with this woman and her dead son reveals that Jesus was exactly who he had said he was all along. The resurrection and the life. But it revealed something else. It revealed the tears of God. And I wonder, which is more remarkable? A man who raises the dead or a God who weeps with hurting people? Over and over and over, these stories occurred. And stories like this are occurring yet still today. We read all through the Bible about people just like us. Weak people, helpless people, hurting people, scared people, desperate people. And people who are guilty beyond question no way to deny what we've done no way to fix what we've done nowhere to go no one to turn to no right to expect mercy no hope of being forgiven and yet just like in the bible time and time again everybody receives the same thing when they come to jesus with a sincere heart grace mercy and forgiveness Now ask yourself, why is the Bible so full of stories about Jesus' encounter with hurting people? Why are these stories in the Bible? Why not just a bunch of rules and regulations and demands that God places upon people? Why does God specifically take the effort to record the encounters Jesus had with hurting people so that 2,000 years later we can be reading these events? Are they there so we can look back in amazement and see the great things that Jesus did? Well, probably. But these stories aren't just in our Bible so we can look back and see what Jesus did. They're there so we can look up and see what Jesus will do for us in our times of need, in our times of pain. Romans tells us that the stories in the Bible were written to give us hope and encouragement for today, for times that we face difficulty for the times we're wounded, for the times that we are at our absolute weakest. Those times you feel like you're worthless to God or he's far and distant away or he's unconcerned or uncaring or doesn't even notice. Stories like this are here to remind us that we have a great physician today. Something happens to people when they realize that the mercy of God touches today like it did back then. Something happens to our faith when the great physician still heals hurting people today. Why did God include those stories in the Bible? Because our stories hadn't yet been written. And God knew that when our stories were going to be written far off into the future, there would be some dark times, some difficult days, some pain that we have to endure. And he wanted us to know that God meets hurting people today just like he did 2,000 years ago. And he wants us to know he not only notices, he cares. I read a story this week about a man whose wife had left him and his three children. And honestly, he didn't have a clue. He didn't see it coming. And after a long search, he found her staying with friends in the Midwest. And he wrote letters and emails and texts and he called and he called. And each time he said, whatever it was, I'm sorry. Me and the kids miss you. We want you back, so let's start all over. Over and over he pleaded with her, but he never got even one response. And finally he scraped all the money together he could. He bought a plane ticket to the city she was in. He rented a car. He drove to the address she was at. He knocked on the door and he said once again, whatever it was, I'm sorry. Me and the kids miss you. 
we want you to come back, so let's start all over. And without saying a word, she turned around, gathered her things, and left with him. He was so stunned that it wasn't until they were on the plane that he asked why she responded this time. He said, I sent letters and texts and emails and phone calls, and you never responded even one time. So he said, what, what made this time different? And she said, this time you came. Beginning with Adam and Eve, God sent prophet after prophet, message after message, story after story, event after event, miracle after miracle, blessing after blessing, until finally, 2,000 years ago, he said, I need to go. When he arrived, he found bruised reeds and smoldering wicks, hurting people, hopeless people, helpless people, wounded people, one after the other, and he never broke one, and he never snuffed one out. What he did with everybody, he did the same as he did with this woman. He looks at her in her, de in her devastation, in her weakness, in her need, and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. That's what he says to bruised reeds and smoldering wicks today. That's what he says to people like you and I. Neither do I condemn you. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Think about the mercy and grace and goodness of God as you face your life's difficulties and trials. Think about the pain that you've had to endure and that you're going to endure at some point in the future. Remember, you have a great physician. Isaiah, the one that talked about the wicks and the reeds, he said this, speaking of Jesus, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain, bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Let's pray. Father, only you know all the difficulties collected here in these cars and the people seated under these tents. You know each life here so intimately. You know the struggles, the difficulties, the pain and the wounds we all carry. And only you are the great physician. So I ask now, God, that as only you can do, that you would touch each heart, each life, each person. That you would reach into each family and be the great physician that we need you to be. And when troubles come in the future, remind us that we have a great physician that we can call on any time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, holy is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, holy is my song. You are
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Oh, you're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down no one like you. You were the God who Isaiah the prophet spoke of, that a bruised reed you will not break and a smoldering wick you will not snuff out. Thank you that you're the God that when we're bruised and broken and beat up, that you're the God that puts us back together and makes us whole again. Uh, we declare that you are good and there was no one like you in all the earth. We bless the God of heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. What we want to do here as we close, and we want to thank you for coming, but we want to bless you. We want to bless you right there in your car. So if you want to put yourself in a position just to receive God's blessing, you might close your eyes or lift your hand or whatever you want to do, but just put yourself in a position to receive God's blessing. I want to pray now. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? And Father, see your children. They're here because they want to meet with you. Father, I pray your blessing over their life. You see all of their life in its entirety. I pray that you'd give them the grace they need for the season that we live in. I pray that your mercy would be new every morning. I pray that you would do what only you can do and go where only you can go, that you would meet them, that you would be the God that meets them in their need. Father, I pray that your hand would be upon them to strengthen them, to help them, the Holy Spirit coming alongside them to help them. And so, Father, bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week. Uh, we're going to direct you out, so if you can just stay where you're at, we'll direct you. And so wave at me. So good to see you. Okay, God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Let, let the parking lot attendants just direct you out. <laughs>